I want to welcome you to uh, today's Tocqueville Project's Lunch Talk. Uh, joining us today is Andrew Cohen. Uh, Andrew Cohen is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at Georgia State University. Uh, his work focuses on toleration, the individual agent as a source of normativity, uh, individualism and communitarianism, the nature of exchange, and the nature of uh, and morality of waste. Uh, today he's talking to us about uh, the harm principle and corporate welfare, so please join me in welcoming uh, Andrew Cohen. Thank you. Um, so let me say this first. This, pa this is a paper I've worked on for a long time, on and off. Uh, when I first wrote the paper, it was about 45 pages long. Uh, and I sent it to a journal that did not have any page restrictions or word restrictions. And the editor sent it back to me within about 20 minutes of me sending it in and said, yeah, cut this in half. I'm not looking at it until you do. <laughs> And I realized he was right, uh, and I sort of left it on the side because I was at that point still too attached to the text. And then I started editing it down, and the current version is 35 pages. And at the end of the day, I now think the paper could probably be 15 or 20 pages. It's a really very simple argument at the end of the day, or at least I hope it to be a very simple argument. It's an argument, nonetheless, that doesn't get made nearly enough, uh, and a lot of people simply think I'm wrong, including a lot of people that agree with me about a lot of other issues related to it. So with that as a preface, let me say this. Uh, I've been w developing my views about toleration uh, for several years. I just had a book come out uh, that sort of lays out the basic view, and I'm working on a second one where I give sort of a firmer grounding and defense of the overall view, uh, and then also explains more about how it's going to work uh, in these sort of more practical issues as well, including the corporate stuff. And so the original title of this was Toleration and Corporate Welfare. I'll say more about why uh, it doesn't matter if it's toleration and corporate welfare or the harm principle in corporate welfare in a few moments. But uh, let me just tell you about a recent case. Uh, like, this is like last week. I am on the board of my condo community uh, in Atlanta. Uh, I no longer live in the condo community, but I'm still on the board. And there is a case where a woman was foreclosed on. She lost her home. She had a mortgage with uh, one of the big banks. Um, I believe she paid roughly $105,000 for her condo. I don't believe she ever put any work into fixing the condo up. Um, so the condo is not in the greatest of shape. Uh, she was foreclosed on, and the bank that foreclosed let's just say, failed to tell anybody that they foreclosed. So it was all legally done, and we still believed, as everybody else did, that this woman who had to move out was the owner, and we, couldn't, we weren't getting paid what we were supposed to get paid. Come to find out almost two years later that the bank foreclosed. Like, okay, so now we have to try to transfer over the account and try to get as much money from her as we can for what she owes us and now start billing the bank for what they owe us the last two years. The bank then uh, put the unit on the market. It was on the market for about a month. I think that's right. Uh, and then it sold. But it did not sell on the open market. It sold to HUD, Housing and Urban Development. Remember, she paid $105,000. HUD paid, her, paid the bank that foreclosed on her $168,400. HUD paid $60,000. $3,400 more for the unit than the bank, than, than the unit sold for when she bought it. Right? The market is not better now. The market is worse now. The, the unit should have sold for less. HUD, got, HUD allowed the bank to be completely bailed out. HUD completely bailed out the bank. The bank lost nothing. I assume the difference between the 105 and the 168.4 was meant to cover whatever costs the bank suffered in the meantime, right? and their foreclosure costs. It's hard to me to imagine that it's a $65,000 addition, but there you go. I'm assuming that's what a lot of that is. HUD is now turning around and selling the, selling the unit. I haven't seen the final documents yet, but my guess is it's going to sell for about $90,000. Okay. Bank is made whole. The woman is out of a home. The taxpayers pick up a tremendous amount of money, right? So you go from 105 dollars to 168 dollars 
uh, that's an addition. That's a loss of sixty-five thousand dollars, and then selling it for ninety thousand. So the seventy thousand dollars is not recouped. Right? That's a huge loss, and that's not an isolated instance. That happens all the time. That is a form of what I would call corporate welfare. That is not, to my mind, what housing and urban development was meant to do, but that is what it does. It bails out the banks. The banks don't lose money on the mortgages. The bank put out a risky mortgage with somebody that they should have been able to predict was going to have problems paying the mortgage. But given the way the, the law works, given the way the government rules are set up, they're encouraged to give out those mortgages. And this, to be clear, is not really different, even though we've gone through the Great Recession and people talked about a housing bubble and all that. The issue is still there, right? And it happens all the time now. And there's reason I think it's getting worse again. Worse in, in, in the fact that the government is now encouraging banks to give out bad loans again. Right? So that's the problem. Uh, if a bank wants to give out a bad loan, that is, to my mind, up to the bank. For the government to bail out the bank after it gives out a bad loan, that's a different story. That's what I have a problem with. As it happens, my broader view of toleration also suggests that there's a problem with this, and hence this paper. So my broader view is really based in uh, a uh, uh, a theory from John Stuart Mill. I don't know if you've read it. I'm assuming some of you have read uh, uh, On Liberty, probably John Stuart Mill's most famous work. Uh, maybe not. Some of you have read other of his works, I'm sure. But in there he says, the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. This is what we call the harm principle. Some people call it the liberty principle. I'm going to call it the harm principle. This seems right to me. It seems to me that what we want the government to do is protect us. We don't want the government to do other things. We want the government to protect us and make sure that we are safe from harm. We have to flesh out what that means. Mill himself veers pretty far astray from endorsing the harm principle as stated, right? The harm principle says pretty clearly the sole end, the only purpose for which power can be exercised. In his writings on economics, though, uh, and even elsewhere in On Liberty, uh, Mill strays from this, and he suggests the government can do other sorts of things. I think that's a mistake. So at the end of the day, I'm not a million, as I don't think Mill is right about everything, but I think he's got the right principle here, and I think if you read the part of the book where this is talked about, it basically gets it right. So on, that, on the one hand, you've got the harm principle. On the other hand, you've got uh, welfare packages from the government. And people like to complain about welfare to individuals. In the 90s especially, I think it was really common to talk about welfare queens and things like this. But today, still, you get a lot of people complaining about how much welfare we give to individuals and to families. Uh, and I've always found that rather amazing. So. Here's a little graphic that I pulled off, up, off of the web last week. Uh, we pay $36 uh, each, it says, for food stamps. That is, each of us out of our taxes pay $36 per year to, to provide food stamps to people, and $870 for corporate subsidies. That's not quite right. <laughs> if you never trust graphics on, online, right? Um, so you have to check into it, and it's not quite right. The $36 is the amount paid by the average taxpayer earning $50,000 per year. The $870 is the amount paid by the average family, right? So if the average taxpayer earning $50,000, so you take an, a single person earning $50,000, on average, they're going to pay $36 a, a year for uh, food stamps and $870 a year for corporate subsidies. Nope, that's not quite right. The $870 for corporate subsidies is the average family. Right? So I don't want to go too far into taxation, but this idea of an average person earning $50,000 is itself a fiction because one person earning $50,000 may pay considerably more in taxes than another person earning $50,000, depending on all sorts of variables in their background. But then the $870 is not average taxpayer earning $50,000. It's the average family, right? including families earning millions of dollars and families earning considerably less than millions of dollars. So those are quite different. Uh, one is average taxpayer earning a certain amount. The other is the average family. Those are very different. And then you might 
say, but the problem here is that the $36 is only food stamps, and that's only a small bit of all of the welfare programs to individuals. I'd say that's true, but the $870 is really just direct grants and subsidies to corporations. If you look at all the, all the data, um, and the, the, the data is at the Cato Institute site, if you want it, I can give it to you later. later um, the number, some people estimate it as much as $6,000 coming out of each family on average, right? That's huge, right? Even if the $36 is low, uh, the $870 is also going to be low. The difference that we, the different, difference, the different amounts that we put into individual welfare and corporate welfare is tremendous. So I have never really gotten that incensed about individual welfare. I just, I don't like it, but I get more incensed about corporate welfare. I think we should do away with both. People get upset about individual welfare, but the fact is most individuals that receive welfare from the federal government receive it for less than 18 months. Like 90% of people that get individual welfare from the government are off of it in 18 months. That's not true for corporates. Right? Corporations take the money now and forever, and they keep trying to get more and more. So again, I am not going to be somebody here who's going to sit here and say we need to get rid of food stamps we need to get rid of all the other forms of welfare to individuals and families. That's not my issue. My issue is corporate welfare. And I think the harm principle very clearly does not allow for corporate welfare. I think we should do away with it for that reason alone. The harm principle is a normative principle of toleration. That is, it tells you when toleration has to end. Right? And it tells you it has to end at a very simple point, when there's harm. It indicates when acceptable use of force is present, when you can, in fact, use force, when you can, in fact, use coercion to limit what people can do. When is that? When people do harm. When that occurs, you can use force and stop tolerating. Very simple, very straightforward. It's a strong claim, though, that only harm to others ever justifies interference. Only harm to others justifies interference. Right? If I'm going to say that, I have to back up and say, well, what do we mean by harm? Right? So I have these sorts of debates with people on a fairly regular basis. The chair of my department thinks that the government should interfere if, for example, an individual is walking down the street and stubs his toe. He thinks that would be reason for government interference. If there's a rock in the street and the person stubs their toe in the rock, they seem to be harmed. I think that's sort of crazy. How could you possibly say the government should be involved with somebody stubbing their toe on the rock in the middle of the street? That seems kind of crazy to me. And so when I say that the harm principle says you can only interfere when there's, in fact, harm, I have a very specific meaning of harm in mind. I don't mean every little hurt or pain. I don't even mean large hurts or pain. Harm and hurt are not the same thing. A hurt is, I, one way to talk about a hurt is it's a setback to interests. If you're hurt, you're not getting what you want. Something is not happening that you want to happen. You have an interest in doing something that's not happening. I presume when you stub your toe in the street, you have an interest in not feeling pain. That interest has been set back. Right? Question is, do we have to do anything to forward your interest in not stubbing your toe? And I think the answer to that is no. Why? Because we're talking about harms and not hurts. Stubbing your toe in the street is a hurt. Having a branch from one of your trees fall on you might be a really unfortunate hurt, but it's a hurt, it's not a harm. Somebody throwing a rock at you or throwing the branch at you, that's presumably a harm. Why? Because a harm, I'll come back to the Valente principle in a moment, a harm is a wrongful setback of interest. Or put more simply, a harm is a wrongful hurt. Only when there are wrongful hurts should there be interference. That's what the harm principle says. Only when there's a harm, and by that we mean a wrongful setback of interest, should we in fact have any sort of interference permissible. That's the best way to read the harm principle. Um, that's not just me saying that. Uh, Joel Feinberg in the 1980s wrote this uh, his magnum opus, I think, a, a four-volume work on the moral limits of the criminal law. 
uh, and the four-volume work is called The Moral Limits of the Criminal Law. And there are four volumes. Uh, let's see if I can remember them all. Uh, harm to others, harm to self, offense to others, and uh, harmless wrongdoing, I think. I won't swear to the last title. Right? And in this four-volume work, which I should say started out being half a book, he was supposed to co-author a book with somebody else, and the other person was a law scholar, and he was going to write the legal side of it. Uh, but it kept getting bigger and bigger, and Feinberg ended up saying to his uh, supposed co-author, I'm going to have to do this on my own, <laughs> went to the publisher, said, what do you think about a book like this? The publisher said, yeah, that's good. Uh, as he worked on it, he realized, no, nope, it's going to have to be two volumes. Then, no, nope, it's going to have to be four volumes. And Feinberg was big enough that the publisher said, yeah, let's do that. And it's, I still think the best treatment of the harm principle, and what he's doing in this, in this work, the, the moral limits of the criminal law, is trying to figure out the best way to understand the harm principle and what a commitment to liberalism means. For Feinberg, a commitment to liberalism is a commitment to the harm principle in a modified form. I'll explain what that means in a little bit and to one other principle, which I'll also come back to in a moment. So um, Feinberg is the one that, that came up with this understanding of harm, and he's putting it in the context of Mill's uh, uh, harm principle and on liberty and trying to flesh out what Mill means. And I think he's really well explained and defended the view that what Mill had to mean was anytime there's a wrongful setback to interests, uh, interference is permissible. I should say not required. Right? It's not the case that when there's a harm, we're going to have to require interference. There might be some very minor harms uh, that would just uh, be silly for there to be any sort of interference with at all. So, I mean, imagine uh, I live in Atlanta, so this, this example works better where I am. Uh, but I don't know where your airport is exactly or how you would get there. But from my campus, you get on a train and you're at the airport 10 minutes later. So imagine that you can do that. Imagine somebody comes in here and slaps you across the face. I assume that's wrongful. I assume it sets back your interest. I assume that's a harm. They come in here, they slap you across the face, they run out, they get on the train, they go down to the airport, they fly to Brazil. Do we really want to interfere with that person? Do we really want to send the police to Brazil to bring them back? No. Right? Interference is permitted, but all things considered, it would be a bad idea, and so we don't do it. Right? So the harm principle says, yes, you can interfere. doesn't say you must interfere. Right? Importantly, though, it says you can only interfere if there's a harm. That's the really important part. The Valente principle in the middle there, Valente non fit injuria, says basically if you welcome it, it doesn't count as an injury, or if you consent to it, it doesn't count as an injury. And what's really important about this in helping in, in, in getting to see that Feinberg's interpretation of harm is correct is the juria part. Right? The root of the word injury, which comes from injuria, is the same root as the word jurisprudence and anything else <laughs> with that in there. Right? So the idea is there's some sort of valid claim to law here. So if there's an injury in the sense of a wrongful setback of interests, then some sort of legal interference is permissible. And it doesn't have to be interference by the government, but definitely the government is permitted. So what is a harm? It's not just a hurt. It's a wrongful setback to interests. If you consent to something, though, you cannot claim to be harmed. Right? So a boxer who gets in a ring and says, yes, let's have a fight, and then gets punched, can't turn around and say, ooh, you harmed me. Right? He can say, you hurt, you hurt me, sure, but he can't claim to have any interference. The harm principle, then, allows for each of us, one of Mill's points, to have a sphere of action around us. One way to think about this is to, to, to think about having a literal invisible sphere around you where nobody's allowed to invade your space. If anybody invades your space, you have a valid claim against them. So some people will say, your liberty ends at the front of my nose. Right? As, soon as, as soon as you go across that sphere of action and hit me in the face, hit my nose, then I can claim to be harmed. As long as you stay outside of my sphere, I can't claim that you've harmed me at all. Right? The harm principle also allows that we can combine those spheres of action. So you and I can agree to do something. You and I can agree to get into a boxing ring together and have a fight. And once we've done that, neither of us can 
say that the other one harmed them. Of course, if you cheat, then you can say that you harmed me, right? If, if you cheat and you put, I don't know, a roll of quarters in your boxing glove or something like that, which I assume is against the rules, then we would say that you wrongfully hurt me, you wrongfully set back my interests, and we can have interference. But assuming that we're playing by the rules and there's no wrong, then whatever hurt you have is not a harm and you cannot interfere. Very importantly, the harm principle does not provide any help for combining spheres of action. Two people want to do something together, they can do it together. They can get in the boxing ring together. If 100 people want to do something together, they can get in a boxing ring, if it's big enough, and fight. You can have fight clubs. As long as everybody's voluntarily there, there's not a problem with this. You can have as many people as you want voluntarily, because of the Valente principle, voluntarily welcoming the interaction with one another. And that would mean that there's no room for interference because there would be no injury, no harm, no wrongful setback to interests. But they cannot expect anybody to help them combine spheres of action. They can't expect anybody to help them set up the boxing ring. That is very important. Cannot expect anybody to help you. So there's no interference except to prevent or rectify harm. There's no interference to benefit, right? So cannot expect anybody to help you combine spheres of action, so there's no aid. And very quickly it follows that there's no corporate welfare. Because what is corporate welfare? It's aid to corporations, right? It's aid to corporation provided without there having been any harm that justifies the interference to give the aid. Now, some people will say, but wait a minute. You say there's no interference permissible, right? But you don't say there's no aid permissible. This doesn't quite work that way. I actually want to read the harm principle as saying there's no interference, period, where interference is either aid or somehow uh, setting back the person, preventing them from doing what they want to do. But even more than that, the fact is when you have corporate welfare, the welfare has to come from somewhere. Right? Where is the aid to corporations coming from? And we saw where it's coming from. It's coming from the taxpayers. Right? $870 of, on average coming from us to go to corporations. We'll talk about certain examples of that in a little bit, including, well, we talked about the bank already. So, while harms to others obviously can justify interference, right, some people will say there is a another way to go. And Feinberg himself, as I said before, went a slightly different way. Feinberg thought the principle as written, where only harm justifies interference, where that's the sole reason for, the sole justification for interference, Feinberg said no. What we should realize is something like this. Harm is always a prima facie reason for interference, but it's not necessarily the only such reason for interference. And Feinberg indeed thought that uh, the offense principle should be added to the harm principle. That is to say, he thought that something really offensive, not just any small offense, but a really serious offense that was not a harm could justify interference. Right? So pornography on the wall outside the classroom building would be offensive, should not be permitted. We can interfere with it, according to Feinberg. I disagree with that but I'm not gonna worry about it here because the offense principle, I take it as obvious, does not do you any good with regard to corporate welfare. You're not gonna get from somebody's doing an offense, so we should provide corporate welfare. That's not gonna work. Um, so the question then is, okay, you wanna say that we can use a weaker version of the harm principle where we say that harm is always a prima facie reason for interference, but so is X. The question is, what is the X gonna be? And we can talk about this in terms of talking about, as Feinberg did, other liberty-limiting principles. The first one is the offense principle, as I said, which Feinberg actually endorsed, which I think was a mistake on his part. The second one is legal moralism, uh, which basically says there are some immoral acts that although they are not harmful, uh, they are nonetheless the sort of thing that we can interfere with. Right? So historically, this was actually, and to some extent still is, a very potent uh, motivation behind law, right? If it's not obvious, I'll make it obvious. Legal moralists 
think that we should not legalize gay marriage. They think it's immoral, and therefore we should interfere with it. Legal moralists in the past have argued against having uh, black people marry white people, have argued against black people being able to vote, have argued against women being able to vote. Legal moralism is pretty well on the side. There aren't very many people who take legal moralism seriously, right? And I think for good reason. And in any case, again, we don't have to worry about it too much here because it's not at all clear that you can go from any sort of harmless immorality to defense of corporate welfare, right? What would be the harmless immorality that would get you a defense of corporate welfare? I don't think you can. Uh, I think we should just cl completely reject legal moralism, but even if we don't, it's not going to get you anywhere with, le with, with regard to having corporate welfare. The third principle is uh, legal paternalism. Again, historically, very important motivation for law. Currently, still, a very strong motivation for law. We interfere with people all the time for their own benefit. Seatbelt laws, helmet laws, just two easy examples. These are things we require them as a matter of law, and we say we can interfere with you if you don't do them because this is in your own interest. Drug laws, alcohol laws, same thing, tend to be based on paternalism. These things can hurt you. We're not going to let you do them. Again, I think we should do away with legal paternalism. I don't think legal paternalism is a good justification for any law. I think people should be able to go out and buy whatever drugs they like, um, and on and on. Uh, but again, even if that's not the case, even if I'm wrong and there's a form of legal paternalism that's defensible, I don't see how it's going to get you anything with corporate welfare. Right? The fact that you should not be able to do something that sets back your own interests, if it's a fact, which I think it's not, is not going to get you to corporate welfare. So the final one, what I call the benefit to others principle. Benefit to others principle basically says it's a good prima facie reason for interference that we can benefit other people, right? And so why would we want to have food stamps? Well, because it's a good thing to benefit those people. And let's be honest, some people that get food stamps would really suffer without them, and it does seem like even though they're not being harmed, we're not stopping them from doing anything, we're not wrongfully setting back their interests, it does seem like there's an intuition that we should benefit them. And so we interfere with everybody else through some taxation in order to benefit these few people that get food stamps. That seems reasonable. I actually think it's wrong, but that's okay. That's the, 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 that is the principle. The point here is this is the principle, the benefits to others principle is the principle that would in fact justify corporate welfare in the same way that it justifies individual welfare. What I mean by that is when I spend time with um, economists, economists uh, are by and large very much in favor of having corporations. Why? Because it's really efficient. Right? It allows you to pool resources in a very simple, easy way that would not be otherwise available. If you don't have corporations to pool the resources of hundreds or thousands of mi or millions of people, you'd have to have a lot of bilateral and multilateral contracts between all the people involved. Having corporations does away with that. All you have to do is sell shares, stocks in your company, and the person then owns part of the company. That's how you pool the resources. They give the money to the company when they buy the first, the first stock. Um, and that allows the company to create goods more efficiently. It allows the pooling of resources more efficiently, et cetera. So the benefit to others principle is what might justify corporate welfare in the same way that it justifies uh, individual welfare because it benefits the corporations. In fact, economists will say it doesn't just benefit the corporations, it benefits everybody else because when the corporations are capable of producing things more efficiently, they can sell goods less expensively, and of course that's good for everybody. So the claim goes. So people that advocate for corporate welfare, and here I'm less talking about economists and more people that have just sort of written either theoretical pieces in defense of it or sort of public uh, advocacy type pieces, uh, we can call them special interest liberals. This was a popular term in the 1950s and is still uh, used some, it was popular in political theory in the 1950s and is still used some by journalists. Alliance capitalists, also common in political theory in the 1950s. Uh, corporatists, a more recent term, I think, not that often used. 
Neoliberalism seems to be the common term today. I put a question mark there because I honestly do not know what this word means. It's never been clearly defined. Special interest liberals, alliance capitalists, corporatists, these have actually been defined in theoretical research trying to explain what they're talking about. The term neoliberal is just thrown around very loosely. Uh, crony capitalists is another new term, a little bit loose. People aren't really clearly defining it, but the idea basically is that you are cronies to the people in, in, in government in order to get money from them. My favorite term uh, is simply promotionists. Right? And the idea here is that government should be involved to promote corporate interests. Right? <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about either corporate welfare or promotionism more generally. And there are multiple forms of corporate welfare. Perhaps the most common form of corporate welfare that people talk about today is protectionist activities. Protectionist activities include things like import tariffs. Right? You put an import tariff on any cotton good, what does that do? It helps our cotton industry. You put an import tariff on steel, what does that do? It helps our steel industry. It raises the price of the incoming good, allowing the domestic company to sell the good at a lower price or at a higher price, really, at a, at a better profit margin, I should say, right? If the incoming goods, the imported goods, were allowed to be priced at what the importing company wants them to be priced at without the tariffs, they could undercut the domestic companies. That would cause a problem for the domestic companies. So you put tariffs on them, that raises the prices of the imported goods, that allows the domestic companies to sell their goods at the higher price without losing any business or any money. Uh, an older form of corporate welfare is what Adam Smith called mercantilism. Um, this is a very old term, but it's not exactly an out-of-date uh, sort of corporate welfare. It's still very common. Uh, mercantilism is essentially government aid to help domestic corporations do business elsewhere. Right? So in a nutshell, uh, subsidies for exports, where protectionism puts tariff taxes on imports. Uh, mercantilist activities, generally speaking, will give subsidies to companies to export their goods. And again, the theory is that the more our companies export, the more business they're doing, the more business they're doing, the more people here they're hiring. So this is all a benefit. And so we should do it as a benefit to all of Americans or, or all of Europeans, depending on where you are. So those are probably the two most common forms of corporate welfare we, talk, we usually talk about. You see some discussion of uh, I think, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong about this, but I think you see some uh, discussion in uh, standard everyday journalism about protectionist and mercantilist activities, even if they're not using especially the second word. But then there are other forms of, uh, of corporate welfare that I think are as important but haven't been named before, so I thought I'd give them names. Uh, and the first one is what I call the... Uh, internal promotionism. Internal promotionism is like mercantilism, but goes on completely domestically. So it's the government aiding corporations in promoting the corporation's business within the domestic territory. Right? So for example, when municipalities provide support for sports teams, when municipalities give uh, support for building new uh, sporting arenas, that's a form of internal promotionism. When a municipality gives uh, support in the form of a, a grant of monopoly rights to cable companies, that's a form of internal uh, promotionism. Right? Absent that support, it would be hard for the people that build the sports stadium, well, I should back off on that and say, one would think it would be hard for the people that build the sports arenas to make money. Right? You think, well, if they're going to make money anyway, we don't need to support them, right? As it turns out, what happens in most sporting arenas uh, throughout this country is we help build the buildings, that is the taxpayers help build the buildings, and then the company owning the sports team keeps all the profits. Right? So that's a form of corporate welfare. Cable company, if we didn't give monopoly grants to the cable company, we would get a lot more competition for providing cable television services and now, of course, internet services, et cetera. So that helps those cable companies do their business making being able to sell their products at a higher price than they would otherwise be able to do. 
The next type, also previously unnamed so far as I know, so I gave it a name, reverse mercantilism. This is, whereas mercantilism is basically helping support domestic companies to export their goods, reverse mercantilism essentially helps foreign companies to produce things here. So you give grants to foreign companies to open up production facilities in America. More common than you might think, right? Anytime a car company from overseas opens up a plant here, you can bet they got some grants from the federal government, and in many cases, the state government. Right? So any grant to a foreign company to open up a business here, again, typically it's manufacturing, but it could be anything, um, is going to be what I would call reverse mercantilism, which is a form of corporate welfare. It helps that foreign company do business. Why does the American government or the state government want to help those foreign governments? Because they're going to hire Americans, and that's supposed to be a benefit to everybody. Again, it's the benefit to others principle that's generally going to be used to uh, justify corporate welfare. Finally, uh, internationalism. Uh, should be an M, not a T there. Uh, internationalism is a new thing. It hasn't actually, to my knowledge, happened yet, but I won't swear that it's not going to happen. It was supposed to happen under Bush Jr. Um, so uh, if people paid attention to the steel tariff under Bush Jr., uh, there was a huge outcry from uh, various countries that we were uh, putting tariffs on imported steel. The WTO sided uh, against us and said we can't put these tariffs on the steel, and if we do, they're going to allow uh, the European Union, uh, especially, to put tariffs on American goods. At the time when they did this, though, there was this idea floated before the WTO. It didn't get a lot of press. It should have gotten more press. Than it's, it's sort of dismaying that it didn't. But there was this idea floated. It did not pass. But there was this idea floated that they would put a tariff on all steel everywhere and use the money raised internationally, not by the U.S. government, not by the EU, not by any particular government anywhere else, the WTO would put the tariff on all steel, collect the tariff, and use that to rebuild the steel industry internationally. That's what I'm calling internationalism. I, sorry? All of this is stupid in my view. <laughs> like, every one of these, I think, should be rejected, right? <laughs> so to be perfectly clear, these things happen, except for the last one so far. I don't think any of them should happen. Right? They all happen. They all happen from the federal government. Um, and they all happen from state governments. Uh, this is another infographic. This one turns out to be pretty accurate, um, I'm, and I'm not going to go through it all, obviously. But this tells you not about federal government aid, but about state government aid. So if you think that state governments don't give corporate welfare, think again, right? So Louisiana, it seems, somebody better at geography correct me, is, is, is it Nissan? Is that Louisiana? That's Mississippi. That's Mississippi? Okay, then what is that? Hollywood definitely is a big one these days. It's true. I have no idea what that company is. Chenier? Does that sound familiar? That's the energy company. Ah. Interesting. Okay. Um, and so here are the top recipients of subsidies from state governments. $13.3 billion, not from the feds, from all the various state governments to Boeing. $13.3 billion, right? That's more than double the next one, which is Intel, then Alcoa, then GM, then Ford, then Fiat. It's rather remarkable, right? Again, this is huge money. Think about what we can do, standard concerns with the uh, 5, 8, 13, 18, 30 odd billion dollars, right? That's a lot of money, it's just, and it's going to these corporations. If you're curious about this, this website, something I recently discovered, I think it's great, um, uh, jobsfirst.org, uh, you can actually go through and look up any company and see what subsidies it gets from who. Like, they list like every company, it's really re remarkable. Uh, so I thought I'd just throw that out there if, you want, if you're curious about looking at it. So with all of that said, now let me come to the main argument. The harm, the, uh, sorry, promotionism is not warranted by the harm principle. I take it that's pretty straightforward. There is no harm that justifies the interference that is the giving of corporate welfare. Right? Promotionism is itself 
harmful. When you're ta taxing all of this money away from individuals, it's money that they could be using to buy food for their kids. It's money that they can be using to buy books. It's money that they can be using to buy computers. It's money given to corporations. Right? It seems to me that that's wrongfully setting back the interests of all these people that have the money taken away. It's also problematic in other ways. Oops. Sorry. There we go. And here's the surprise kicker. The very existence of corporations is a form of corporate welfare. Right? Having corporate law in the first place is corporate welfare. So not only do I think, because I think the harm principle is right, that we should do away with corporate welfare, I think we should do away with corporations. Right? To see that, you have to think about what corporations really are. Corporations have there, there are many variations, don't get me wrong, but there are three main things. The one that I'm not going to talk about at all is called asset lock-in. The two that I am going to talk about just a little bit are limited liability and entity shielding. You've probably heard of limited liability. You might not have heard of entity shielding. You might not have heard of asset lock-in. I'll just give you a brief uh, overview. Limited liability is basically a part of law that protects the stockholders against any corporate debt. So if a corporation goes into debt, either because it borrowed money or because it had a lawsuit filed against it and lost, the stockholders don't have to pay the debt. If the corporation doesn't have the money in its coffers, the money goes unpaid. Right? That's limited liability. Entity shielding is sort of the reverse. It prevents corporations from being liable, liable for the stockholders' debts. Right? So if the, if the stockholder either borrows money and fails to pay it back or has a lawsuit against them and can't afford to pay it, you can't attack the corporation, mostly. There's actually some ways around this a little bit. So take an easy example. Let's say I start my own little ice cream delivery truck. Right? So it's Andrew's uh, good humor truck. They still have good humor? Do you have good humor in New Orleans? Yeah. Um, so I start Andrew's uh, good humor truck, and I start it pretty simply. I buy a truck with a freezer on it, and I start driving around selling uh, the, the, the ice cream. It's a hit. I do really well. It's hot here, right? Ice cream's a good thing, right? So I do really well, and I start hiring people to help me. And I think about this, I say, I have to protect myself, right? So I'm going to incorporate. So now it's Andrew... Andrew's Good Humor Ice Cream Truck Incorporated. Right? I get incorporated. I go through all the legal uh, maneuverings in order to get incorporated. So all this happens, and here's, here's the situation as I'm going to lay it out. Uh, the company is earning, let's say, half a million dollars a year in profit. And what I do every year is look to figure out what my profit is and then give myself a salary based on the profit. And so when I see that the profit is $500,000, I give myself a salary of $499,000. And well, let's just leave it at that, $499,000. And I leave the company with $1,000 in the bank. Now let's say it turns out that I'm a pretty shady business person and I start selling ice cream that is clearly out of date. I like change the dates on it. And kids start getting sick, right? And their parents sue me for their medical bills, for pain and suffering, et cetera. And the court says, yep, Andrew's Ice Cream Truck Incorporated uh, clearly caused these harms, has to compensate the parents and the children for those harms. Uh, we find in favor of the victims, and we insist that each of them gets paid, I don't know, $100,000 a piece. Even specify that there are only four victims. Four victims get $100,000 a piece. But how much money does Andrew's Ice Cream Truck Incorporated have in the bank? $1,000. Each of them will get 250 bucks, and they're done. And that's what limited liability does. They can't attack my assets. Even if I am the sole owner, right, if it's a corporation, if I'm the sole shareholder, my money is protected 
the company doesn't pay out more than it's got in the bank. It goes out of business, sure, but meanwhile, I've got $499,000 in the bank. To be fair, there are ways of sort of piercing that and going after me as well, but that's really actually very hard and very uncommon. Right? That's what limited liability does. And it works the same way with entity shielding. If I, I don't know, uh, instead of paying myself the $499,000, I think, you know, I'm being sued because I ran over Joe's kid, and that's going to be a big lawsuit. I better not have any money in my bank account. Now, I'm the single shareholder in Andrew's Good Humor ice cream truck. What do I do? I pay myself very little. I pay myself $1,000 and leave the $499,000 in the coffers of Andrew's Good Humor ice cream truck. When Joe sues me because I ran over his kid or what have you, they can't attack the $499,000 that's in the corporate coffers. They can only attack the $1,000 that's in my bank account. So having these corporations allows for these sorts of harms to happen. And even more than that, again, the reason for having these corporations, the reason for having corporate law in the first place, apparently, is that it makes for more efficient business. It makes for more efficient pooling of resources, et cetera. <clears throat> but why should we think that the efficiency of pooling resources is reason for interference? It's a reason for interference if you endorse the benefit to others principle. It's not a reason for interference if you endorse the strict version of the harm principle. If you endorse the strict version of the harm principle, getting efficient production is not justification for interference. It seems very clear to me that interfering in order to create efficiency in business is in fact only justified if you endorse, cor if you endorse the benefit to others principle, <coughs> which I reject. So, in the strict version of the harm principle, if you endorse the strict version of the harm principle, which I think we should, then you get no corporate welfare and you get no corporations. If you want to go and endorse the benefit to others principle, you'd have to give me more of a reason to think it's right. But if, in fact, you end up endorsing the benefit to others principle, you should recognize that the only thing that's going to carry the, carry the day is efficiency. Whatever gets the most efficiency is going to be what the government should do. If it turns out, as I strongly suspect it would, that giving every citizen a demigrant would be the most efficient way to produce and encourage growth in this country, or any country, or anywhere, that's what the government should do. Right? So if you're going to endorse the benefit to others principle, I still think you're probably not going to have a system very much like ours at all. What you're going to have is perhaps corporations, no other corporate welfare, because the rest of the corporate welfare is clearly inefficient. We can talk about that to some extent if you like during the discussion. But you'll also have tremendously more redistribution to individuals. Right. So in a nutshell, I think you should endorse the strict version of the harm principle and reject all corporate welfare, including the very existence of corporations. If you want to endorse the existence of corporations, then you should probably go to a benefit to others principle. And if you're going to do that, you should recognize that there's going to be radical redistribution to individuals. Giving a demigrant is going to turn out to be a radically efficient way to improve welfare across the board. If that's what you think government should do, that's what you should do, right. not the corporate welfare. And that's it. Thank you. Questions? So, uh, I was kind of questioning the calculation for the welfare. So, are fads included in that? Yeah. But they're not included in that figure, right? No. Okay, so it would be much higher, right? So, you mean the $870 figure? Yeah. No, not included in that at all. No. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's ridiculously higher. Like I said, it's the, the, the number that I've seen most uh, advocated most strongly as being accurate for the full amount of corporate welfare is about six thousand dollars per person. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's really the I don't know if it's the right number, but that's the number. So the, you mean like being ADA compliant with ramps and things like that? It's not going to be required. Permissible. Certainly permissible, sure. 
the harm principle doesn't say you can't do what you want to do to make life better for people. It says you don't have to. Right? So if, uh, if the University of New Orleans wants to put in ramps, they're perfectly it's a little more complicated because it's a public institution, but if a private institution wants to put in ramps, of course they can put in ramps. And of course, it's likely that they're going to want to because why would you want to rule out a customer base? So I would assume that they also would outlaw the taxing of some reserve or industry. Yeah. That's in fact, if you pushed it. Biggest source of public welfare would be. I don't think it's the biggest source, but it's definitely a big one. <laughs> Well, it's a huge one, but it's biggest. It leads to a lot of asset prices for the nation. Yeah, I mean, I'd go further, though. I think, actually, if you took the strict version of the harm principle seriously, we shouldn't have the Federal Reserve at all. Yeah. I think you have a great argument, and I tend to agree with you. But do you actually think that we could implement that? Do you think it would be effective? And do you think it could compete on the world market? The answer to the last question is yes. The answer to the earlier questions is, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> right? Um, I, I, I'd like to think so, um, but I pay attention enough to politics and arguments about how politics works that I'm somewhat skeptical. But I think we should be pushing in the right direction. And I think, frankly, I mean, part of this just is, to use a phrase, a, a war of ideas. And, you know, especially in the 80s and 90s, it was really popular on journalists to talk about welfare queens, right? Talk about welfare queens. I mean, but it it's sort of completely ignores the reality of people who are on welfare, right? And it ignores all of the welfare going to corporations. I think if we somehow figured out a way to sell this, that is to say, made it clear to the public in a way that they could understand easily that corporate welfare is an issue, I think it can make a difference. I'll, I'll give you a different sort of example. Um, the estate tax, right? There's a concerted effort. We actually know exactly who led the effort <laughs> to get people to think about the estate tax as a death tax, right? It was a very concerted PR attempt. A PR firm was hired to get people to talk about the estate tax as the death tax. And since that PR firm started, estate taxes have been reduced throughout the country dramatically, both federal and state, right? Uh, here's an idea. Hire a PR firm to get people to not call it an estate tax or a death tax, but a giving back tax or something else, something that sounds good. And you'll probably persuade people that this is worthwhile. I think something similar is going on here. When we're talking about corporate welfare, we're talking about huge sums of money. Uh, uh, the, the money that, that I talked about for that, uh, the mortgage was a drop in the bucket. Another slightly larger drop in the bucket, about 15 years ago, the federal government gave McDonald's $10 million. Why? Because McDonald's needed to be able to advertise its goods in Europe. And this was a $10 million grant to help McDonald's advertise its goods in Europe. Why am I paying to help McDonald's pay, advertise its goods in Europe? I don't see this at all. I think there must be some way of selling this in a PR way, in the same way that certain people got the PR firm to sell the estate tax as a death tax. We should be able to sell uh, this as something negative and get people to see why it should stop. Am I overly optimistic about this? No. Am I optimistic at all about this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. And then I always fall back and say, but you have to realize I'm a philosopher. I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not out there trying to get things passed through. If I could push a button and end corporate welfare and corporate law, I would. Do I think it's going to happen in our country? Not anytime soon. That doesn't mean we shouldn't work for it, though. Let's think about ownership in large corporations now. Okay. How, how would that even work if you, if you push that button? How, how would you have the existence of any sort of, of decently large company. You wouldn't. I'm okay with that. <laughs> right. Large corporations, large companies are fine. I'm, I'm fine with business firms. I love business. I'm, I'm well, pro business might be too strong, but I'm, I'm very in favor of people buying and selling things. You can have mutuals, you have corporate, you could have partnerships, 
Yeah, anything that didn't require, uh, well, I, I, yes, but more. <laughs> I want to say anything that doesn't require that the government set up special institutions to deal with. And corporate law is a special institution that the government had to set up in order to have corporations. But isn't that partnership would be some sort of intermingling of the individuals who are in the partnership, their individual assets? And, uh, right, but it would be up to them how they were intermingled, as it were, right? So it would just be straightforward contract law. And I'm, I suppose you could say even contract law itself ends up having the same issues. But Yeah, it would be, it would be almost like a marriage the way we see it now. That it would just be a mar the way the marriage works for ten people who are running the business. Yeah. I should say the way you and I probably see marriage, not the way the government sees marriage. Well, but yeah. the, way, the way marriage is used through contract law, right? Now, yeah. In terms of assets, at least yep. in, in states where it's you know where the property is up in the way that we're talking. About. Yep. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with partnerships. I think that's just a, a, a normal part of contract law, and contract law is really just a way of making clear how, how people can trade with one another without doing any harm. Corporate law goes beyond that, right? Corporate law, in fact, invokes these, these basic elements, limited liability uh, and, and, and entity shielding, that, in fact, allow for harms. Corporate law is, is to me, just a huge step away from just allowing contract law. It's a witness. Yes. So, so, so derivative contract, you have to explain derivative contract. Well, the futures. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Good God, yeah. Yeah, derivative. Yeah, sorry. That's the oldest form of in the contract, the futures thing. I hope that's not true. The old-fashioned futures were not like current. Well, the old-fashioned forms of, of futures were not like the derivatives that basically killed the market in the last, what year is this, 2015, so seven years ago. Right. Derivatives as they're practiced today are really scary things in my book. Wait, what's wrong with, with options and futures contracts? Not just options and futures. It's like it's the repackaging of the contract. Which is, that's, not, that's not necessarily a derivative. That's a particular type of... Well, here's the issue, right? I mean, the people that were selling the derivatives, by and large, did not understand what they were selling. Well, yeah, the people that were buying... Yeah, it was derivatives upon derivatives. But the people buying them didn't understand them. The people selling them didn't understand them. I have doubts that AIG understood what they were protecting when they insured them, right? If you, you can't buy and sell something with any form of informed consent if nobody understands what they're buying and selling. But that, that's a risk that should be bared by, by the person who's buying and selling. I mean, the problem I would imagine from your position is, well, don't have the government come in and bail these people out. If you want to buy a box, if you go to the yard sale mm -hmm. and you say, this is a mystery box, mm -hmm. it's $20, right? And so you give your $20 and you open it up, it's a bunch of crap, right. right? You don't want the government to come in and say, well, here's your $20. You're going to deal with your crap. I mean, that's... Yeah. So you can have your derivative contracts. They just be set up as contracts between the parties that are entering into that contract. And if the whole thing blows up, you wouldn't have the government coming in and saying, that's, like, yeah, I, I would. Derivative contracts would be also for corporations. Ah, well, yeah. Typically. That's different. That's because, just, because that's essentially what it is. Right. The corporation is the call. Right. And I just slightly, I, I'd want to add that's, that's a little bit to this. Yeah. But, but there's another factor here, which is, I mean, so what actually happened, right, is AIG was insuring these things, uh, and, a, and, and its shareholders had no idea what it was doing. I think AIG's corporate leaders harmed their shareholders by engaging in this absurdly risky activity. I, I think that there should have been interference protecting the AIG shareholders oh, yeah, that would have prevented the bailout in the first place. In, in, in the actions of the first place. All these things were transparent. Yeah. There in the corporate report. I mean, you knew what they were doing. It's just people don't. You, when you buy, so if you're going to buy, you know, 100 shares of Halliburton or 100 shares of, of Goldman Sachs or whatever else, the vast majority of people don't have any idea what that company is doing. So the vast majority of people shouldn't be buying this stock. That's right. right. As long as things are going up, no big question. Exactly. That's, right. not, that's, not the role for the, that's not the role for the government to come in and say, well, you know, I'm going to make these people whole because they didn't know what they were buying and, you know, 
everyone's telling them they should invest in the stock market and whatever else. <laughs> well, what about the pharmaceutical company that sells a drug and doesn't tell people that it results in greater facial hair growth? That's just a side effect that, you know, we're not going to tell you about it. But this is the issue with, like, the cigarettes. There's a difference between lying to people mm -hmm. and, and not disclosing. And right. disclosing what you're doing in your various SEC right. filings and people not looking into it. Yeah, fair enough, and, and it, ultimately it might come down to what, what AIG actually told its, share, its shareholders. And if they were completely upfront about what they're doing, then fine, maybe I'll go with what you're saying. But I'm pretty skeptical of that claim. Not that I've ever actually looked at their corporate filings and whatnot. I don't, you know, I haven't invested in them. So, But if they were completely upfront about it, then maybe. But my guess is, at the very least, uh, even their actuaries weren't capable of understanding what they were insuring in a way that would allow them to make the right prices for the insurance That's in the first place. AIG oh no, they were insured. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, they held it in their assets portfolio. Both. They, uh, what, I think what happened was that they weren't because they were AAA ratings weren't required to have collateral of, of uh, some of their uh, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, they wouldn't have gone. So, Right. Yeah, I mean, they, they had to have. Well, they did have some stuff in, in their in their portfolio, uh, but it was nowhere near enough to cover. Right. Zero. I thought it, I thought there was a requirement of. Uh, interesting. See, I guess my, my concern isn't so much whether or not the government comes in and bails out you know, banks or, or companies that are engaging in these bad practices, but how, if we run it this way, do we, you know, there's got to be some efficiencies that come with large corporations or any sort of corporation that I don't think you get. So I imagine that, that let's say you and I want to engage in for a business practice. In, in what you discuss, if, if, you, if you run that out, you have to use the asset mingling between your wife, you, me, my wife. Right. It would be a common pool. Right. And at some at some point, it gets it gets absurd. Why? Because no one's going to take on that risk. That's the problem. No one's going to. So so there is. I can't imagine a situation where maybe on on a, on a very small level where I would enter into an agreement with a, a, a large group of people who are saying my wife's assets are coming in from a completely unrelated issue. And this is now, this is an asset pool that the, 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 this group now has, has access to. And unless, no, no that's right. So unless you think that you don't need a corporate, a, a, an ownership more than, than a person or two people, well, I'm not sure that – at the end of the day, I probably think you don't. But if you wanted to do it, you could have 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 people do it, but they would just have very complicated contracts to do so. The contract – and in fact, you know, if I'm going to be honest, you can actually duplicate much of what goes on with limited liability and entity shielding through contract law. You could actually rewrite contracts to include clauses that would re remove any sort of ability to attack the corporation, the, the, the firm, for problems caused by the shareholders and vice versa, that is to say, just mimic the, 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 the two factors. Um, but at the very least, I want to put the pressure on the people that are doing the business, the people that are actually doing it. They should bear the costs. Otherwise, they're putting costs on the rest of us that we did not agree to. And why that wouldn't just be called a negative externality, I have no idea. But that just is something that we're being paid, we're being forced to pay for their benefit. As the standard claim from uh, the mercantilists way back when and from protectionists today is that this benefits Americans because it, caught, it brings more jobs here and things like this. I think the evidence for that is very scant. Supposedly. Right, but so two things. One, uh, if we did that, what we'd end up doing is measuring the number of jobs created by the corporations helped 
not measuring the number of jobs lost to the people that would have done business otherwise. Right? You can't possibly do that because you can't know what would have happened absent this, uh, this regulation. Right? That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, but I mean, I think it's, it's very easy to say, look, if we give this company X dollars or put this tariff on their competitor from overseas or, or whatever, um, they will create 100 jobs. It's really hard to see what those people would have done absent that interference, such that they might have created more jobs, they might have done a lot more business. You just can't know that. But you can imagine a situation where you still have corporate law in place, just like you have, have rule of governing marriage where there is no actual dollar asset transfer from tax-paying citizens to corporations, then it's, it's more of an ease thing. So if right. you look at marriages right now, that you know, when you look at same-sex marriages, you know, the vast majority of rights, or whatever you want to call them, that people acquire, mm -hmm. can be acquired by a basic contract law. And you could do the same thing with the corporation. The problem seems to be is the federal government, the government taking my money and giving it to Chevron or giving it to to Hyundai or whatever. So you could keep your, your corporate... It's also property. taking my money in the first place to write a bunch of corporate law that helps that, that, that allows for the pooling of resources in the first place. Yeah. Or the writing of marriage laws that allow these people to do this, that, and the other thing. I, I, what I think you're saying is that it, it denies compensation to people affected in service. That's what the <coughs> That is one way to say it, yeah. I mean, I, I said I think of it all as, as creating huge negative externalities. So I think that's right. Can you tell me what those few reforms would be? <laughs> well, getting, just getting rid of the, uh, the fact that there's so many lobbyists, I mean, cor corporate lobbyists that are blatantly acting in favor of the people who don't even want to do their constitution. Yeah, the problem is that once you create a government that has all the powers to give promotionist uh, benefits to individuals or companies, you're going to get people that figure out ways around whatever laws you create in order to get the gains. Right? You give the government the power to do all these, let's call them good things for individuals or people, you're going to get lobbyists. You can try to prevent it in all sorts of ways, but I don't think it's going to be successful. The benefits are just too big. But let's not kid ourselves. This is not a new thing, right? This started in the late 19th century with the railroads. Oh, yeah, of course. Right. Right. I mean, so. what, I'm, what I'm saying is, there is that isn't that, I don't know, isn't that conflicting with another principle for letting people give, give what they want to politicians? The legal fiction that corporations are persons is one of the most annoying legal fictions <laughs> there could possibly be. Um, I'm fine with the owner of a large business firm giving to politicians whatever money they want. Um, I'm not so fine with saying it's a matter of free speech, right? Because if the owner wants to say something, they can say something, right? So, yeah, I should probably leave it at that. But, I mean, if you think about the other case, the Hobby Lobby case, right, uh, essentially what the, what the courts ended up finding was that uh, – the, people, the family was closely related to the firm, and they shouldn't be forced to endorse something that they were opposed to. Like, well, if that's the case, then they shouldn't get the benefits of being a corporate corporation, because corporation is supposed to be separate from the owners. Yeah. So I don't see how you do it one way and not have the other. And at the end of the day, I just don't see why people are so concerned to have the sorts of benefits that we're talking about. And that's a little disingenuous, I'll be fair, right? Um, you know, in, in my own system, you know, if if I could somehow get what I want, 
we wouldn't have the large corporations, and I doubt we would have very large business firms. We'd have firms, and they'd be large, but I don't think they'd be anywhere like the size they are now. And they might not be big enough to do some of the research and development that um, that American and European corporations can do, given the assetting, the, the sorry, the pooling of resources. Uh, and I'm sort of like, okay, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. You have this thing about being a moral moralist, mm -hmm. and that you have really nothing to do with corporate welfare. Not so far as I can tell. What about non profit status for versus business organizations? Yeah, then do it away with it. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's not. It's not a matter of the religion. So there might be a way of going about this where the form of moralism would be all about creating good community and not allowing the community to become some sort of. Uh, self-destructive community. And they might try to argue that uh, having nonprofits uh, is necessary for that. And so I suppose the claim would be something like we need to have, uh, whether they be religiously based or not, we need to have organizations that help protect people, that uh, help educate people, um, that help give religious services to people, uh, because that's what creates a good community. I suppose that's the way some legal moralists could go. The, the best legal moralists, I don't think, actually would do that. Um, so, I mean, historically, the two most important moralists were uh, Patrick Devlin from the 1950s and 60s, who uh, a British jurist who argued against uh, legalizing homosexuality, uh, and then going back a century to uh, uh, Stevens, uh, who made very similar arguments. Uh, uh, in response to in response to Mill, but I, I, and they were both very interested in community and protecting community and not letting uh, sort of the degradation of personality and things like this. But neither one of them actually explicitly argued for anything like nonprofit status for charities. I think they both wanted charities, but we all want charities. I mean, I'm not opposed to charities. I'm just opposed yeah, to any sort of right, right. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I should say also, I would do away with corporate taxes in the process of doing away with corporate law. If we're going to have an income tax, income taxes should be charged to people. If you make money, you pay the tax. Period. It doesn't matter if you make the tax through a, fir a business firm or through wages. So no reason to have a separate tax for the firm. On that note, well, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. It.